Hello, and thank you for tuning in to First Baptist Church of Conway. I'm Rocky Taylor, one of the pastors here, and it is our prayer that this will be a resource to help you grow in faith in Jesus and to know His love for you. This video contains the sermon as well as one or two songs from this week's service, and while we are glad to provide this resource, it is not a substitute for being a part of a weekly fellowship of believers with whom you can worship and share life with. I hope to see you here at First Baptist next Sunday at 10 a.m. May God bless you as you remain faithful to Him. Blessing and honor, strength and power Yours alone now and forever Love this world could never stop there is no one like our God Reaching down to touch the broken Mercy breaking through this moment and Faithful is the one who saves Worthy is your name Oh God, the glory is yours The kingdom is come and the battle is over Jesus This week I was talking with one of our, our church members and they came and asked me a question about some administrative stuff and I just simply said, I, I have no idea. And they said, well, well you're the senior pastor. They said this laughingly, by the way. They said, well, you're the senior pastor. You should know that. And I said, well, if that's what you expect, you're going to surely be disappointed in this life. So I bring that up to say that's kind of what I need you to understand about what we're going to talk about today because today we're going to talk about some things I just simply don't understand. I don't have all the answers. Some of the things James says I just quite frankly don't, don't get and I, I've done the best I can. I've looked at people a lot smarter than me and Folks, some of the stuff he says is just one of those things we're going to be challenged by, one of those areas that we're just going to have to step out in faith is. And that's the fun thing about living out on faith 
if we're stepping out and living on faith, that doesn't mean we understand it all, does it? If we're living on faith, that means it's a challenge. We don't understand it. We don't know what's going to happen, and so we kind of do it anyways. And so that's one of the areas we're going to be challenged in today is to step out on faith because some of the things he talks about may make us a little bit uncomfortable. As usual, right? We're finishing up the book of James. And so this is the the very last part of James, and James is going to give rapid fire Just explain to us, well, here's the things you need to do. Here's the kind of people you need to be. Because remember, throughout the letter, he's talked about the different areas and the different things we we shouldn't be, or the things we shouldn't do. Remember, he talked to us about not to have an uncontrolled tongue, right? He's talked about speech over and over and over again. He told us to guard our speech. He told us not to trust in riches and not to trust in our plans. He told us not to be the double-minded type of people who are kind of in and then kind of out. He told us not to show favoritism, not to have dead faith. He tells us not to run from trials and testings, but to embrace them for what they are and what God can do through you in those uh, trials. So he said a whole lot of things we shouldn't do and a whole lot of things we shouldn't embrace, but now he's going to end his letter telling us seven different things or different types of people that we need to become. These things we need to embrace. So today, if you have your Bible with you, let's dive into this. We're going to look at James chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 12. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. It'll be up on the screen. But we're going to just look at seven different areas James challenges us with. Here's the first one. He tells us to be a person of integrity. He says, James 5.12, above all. And by the way, above all, it's concluding his letter. It's letter, leather. Uh, concluding his letter, it's not just here, but it's the rest of it. It's how we know he's closing. So above all, everything else he's about to challenge us with. Above all, my brothers and sisters, that's us. He says, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need to, all you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. And Jesus teaches the same thing. So above all, he says, here's one of the final things he challenges us with, because you know as well as I do, who are the people who need to swear by something? The people who need to convince you they're actually telling the truth. The people who sometimes don't always tell the truth, or sometimes tell the half-truth. Any of us ever told the half-truth? We kind of just left out the stuff that would condemn us? Yeah, it's kind of that. So the people who need to swear and says, hey, well, I swear by this or I swear by that or I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling the truth. They're people who others don't trust. They distort the facts. They don't tell the whole truth. So as Christians, James is saying, you and me, we need to be people of high integrity, extreme integrity. When we say yes, what does that mean? If we say we're going to do something, what does that mean we need to do? Right, not look for ways out, not look for ways to back out, not say, well, maybe kind of if I feel like it. When we say no, it needs to be an honest no. Nothing hidden, no crossing our fingers, right? This is the easy one. Integrity is something we all value, at least I hope you value. And also, this brings up, who are we to swear by anything anyways? If we say, hey, I swear I'll be there, I swear to right? That I'll be there. How do you know you're going to be there? Remember, James has already brought up that who are you? You're just a little vapor. Who are you to trust in your plans? Remember, we are to say, if God willing or if God allows, I'll do this. So when we start swearing that these things are going to happen, we're acting like we really know the future. And James has already reminded us, no, you don't. You can't promise something. You don't know if you're even going to be here tomorrow. What's going to happen tomorrow? So James is saying we must maintain a high level of truth, a wholeness to our speech and to our action. We must live with single-mindedness. When we say we're going to do something, what do we need to do, folks? Right, because people are watching us as people of Jesus Christ. The last thing you want them to do is look at you and think, well, Jesus is untrustworthy then. If that's what it means to be a Christian... If that's how they are, if that's what Jesus is about, no thank you. So how's your integrity? Do you come through and do what you say you're going to do? Do you back out of plans? Or are you a committed person? Are you someone of high integrity? Next up, James says, remember, rapid fire, there are different topics he's going to talk about. Next up, he says, be a person of prayer. He says, is anyone among you in trouble? 
Let them pray. Anybody ever been in trouble before? Yeah, we think about trouble with the law or Lord. If you get me out of this, I will go to church on Wednesdays. Y'all ever said a prayer like that growing up? You say, God, if I get out of this, if my mom doesn't find out, I will go to church on Wednesday nights. Even Wednesday, Lord, that's how committed. Right. This isn't just that kind of trouble. This trouble speaks to all difficulties in life. Suffering, affliction, because all of God's people, every single human being will go through trying times. Rather than criticizing others, because isn't that what happens when life is hard, when life is difficult? We look around and we start blaming other people. We start criticizing other people. We start looking at how it's somebody else's fault. So rather than letting our speech get negative, we need to use that troubling, that hardships, those things that are going on in our life as an indicator that we need to do what? Answer's right here, folks. Pray. When you're experiencing trouble, suffering, hardships, your first reaction should be to pray. You see, the common thing for all humans is that all of us have to express ourselves. The common thing that even if something's bothering us, we're like, well, Brian, I'm a closed off person. I don't really like to tell anybody anything. That's fine. You still need to get it out. Because if you don't get it out, what happens? I already know. You keep it bottled up and it eventually goes off. And then eight years worth of stuff comes out at once, right? I have a best friend who does that. When we'd grow up, he'd keep everything bottled in. Then when it came out, Everything, it depends on who it was, but it all came out from everywhere. So James says, no, no, don't keep that stuff bottled up. Pray. All of us need to get that stuff out to talk, to get it out. In fact, there's a whole industry built around, did you know we pay people now to listen to us? Yeah, like a lot, a couple hundred dollars an hour. We pay them just listen to us. They're called counseling. And look, I'm all for counseling. Counseling's great. I've done it. You should do it if you need it. Counseling is an amazing thing. But significantly more important than going to a counselor is what? Praying. Pray. Do you pray? Do you seek God when things are going wrong? When you're frustrated at work, when you can't cover your bills, when there's tension in your friendships, when your kids aren't doing well at school, when your kids aren't making new friends, when you're facing difficult with family, Thanksgiving's coming up, when you're facing difficult with family, or the in-laws, when our children aren't doing okay, when all those trials, all those temptations, all those sufferings, all those hardships, they start building up, building up, building up, what do you do? James says, pray. Seek God. Ask him for his purpose. Ask him for insight. Ask him for direction. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him for his power to change the circumstance. Go to God and pray. You see, sometimes I just react. How about y'all? I just react. He says, no, 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 pray. Seek God. What did we talk about last week? Patience. Remember that? I was talking to one member. I said, remember a couple weeks ago when you talked about patience? I said, I talked about it two days ago. He said, wow, it's been running through my mind a lot. I said, wow, it must have. Huh? You thought it was a month ago. It was just two days. I've been thinking about it that much. Right, be patient. So how's your prayer life? You see, many times we'll call on people and we'll ask people to pray for us. But James, first, and this is very important, folks, first, you're called to pray. God wants an intimate relationship with you. You seek God first. You pray, pour your heart out to him. Next up, he says this. He says, be a person of praise. Next slide. So, ignore praising. Okay, it should say, be a person of praise. I had an error. James 5.13b says, is anyone happy? How many of you have been happy before? How many happy are you right now? Yeah, life's going okay. See, often we look at the Bible talks about the troubling and the difficulties, which our life has plenty. But sometimes things are just going all right. Isn't that a good thing when things are just, hey, life's going okay. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm kind of happy today. James says, great, got advice for you. Sing songs of praise. If you're happy, start praising God for it. Thankfully, we see that our, life aren't, our lives aren't just going to be full of troubles and disappointment and hardship, that they are going to be happy, good times. And when things are A-OK, we need to praise. Remember the theology behind this. Look what James says here in the next verse. He says, James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. So when those good things happen, when those positive things happen, we praise, we sing joyfully to our God. When you're in trouble, pray. 
When life is going good, sing. Regardless, James is telling us that you and I, we need to keep that relationship strong with our Heavenly Father. So how's your singing? You do pretty good at it? How's your praising? Did you know that you can sing praises to God all day, every single day? You see, one of the things that radically transformed my relationship with Jesus Christ, I've told you this before, one of the things that radically transformed my Christian life was music. You see, I told you I grew up listening to hip-hop and rap. And I would come to church as a young adult, and they would sing hymns. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But to me, what I learned was it seemed like singing and praising God was just for Sunday mornings with these songs I didn't really particularly care for. Now, don't get me wrong. Hymns are growing on me. But I only sung hymns when I went to church. And for the record, if someone doesn't like hymns, did you know that's okay? It got quiet. Why is that so quiet? Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all like hip-hop? Is it okay for you not to like hip-hop? It's okay for me not to like hymns. We agreed about something. Right? Music is just a preference. Remember, there's no such thing as Christian music. There's Christian lyrics. There's no such thing as Christian music. It doesn't exist. There's Christian lyrics. And so for me, what radically changed my life is because nobody listened to hymns. Nobody in my family listened to hymns. Nobody, when I turned on the radio, I didn't hear hymns. I didn't own any hymn CDs. I didn't listen to that. But when I found Christian hip-hop, it allowed me at a very critical point, and I cannot stress this enough, when I was a young adult, a very trying time, a very difficult time, I found music that allowed me to relate to God. Do you know how important that is for a young adult? where I've realized that I can communicate to God, I can express what's going on in my heart. And it radically transformed my relationship with God. God started to seem relatable. God started to seem like he cared about me. And so I would listen to this type of music all throughout the day, driving in the car, in my headphones at work, in those negative environments, I would listen to positive music that I actually enjoyed and spoke to my heart. You see, God used Christian hip-hop to bring me radically closer to him i mean very intimate with him and now i predominantly listen to praise music of all sorts in the car or wherever i go i love to praise we should never come to church just to worship god did you know that you should worship our god all the time every day this is why here at our church we try to incorporate both types of music We want everybody to learn. You can turn on the radio now and hear Christian music, and you can pray sitting on 501 traffic. Sometimes. It's hard to do, isn't it? (laughs) But maybe we should try praising sitting in traffic. One thing I want to encourage you to do is not just come to church and sing music here and then listen to bluegrass or country or that soft rock, whatever you listen to. Try worshiping and praising God all the time. It will radically transform your life because today we have access to all sorts of music through technology. And you may say, well, Brian, I don't don't really sing. Well, James tells us to sing, doesn't he? So if you don't really care for singing, try rapping. How many of y'all try rapping? (laughs) One of us. Okay, Mackenzie, you try to rap? He's saying yes, we're going to have next week, we're going to have you up here rapping, okay? (laughs) I've tried asking Rocky to do it. He's like, I'm not doing it, but I'm I'm working on him. I'm working on. So, but he says to sing. So even if you're not the type to sing, try it anyways. God gave you a voice. It may not be very good. I understand that. But sing praises to God. Learn to be a person of praise. Next up, he tells us to be a person of faith. This is going to be a challenging one. Look at what he says. He says, James 5, 14 through 15. He says, is any among you sick? Sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith, this is the hard part, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, this is the verse I quite frankly just don't understand at all. I'm just going to be honest with you. According to Scott McKnight, he says the word translated sick is a general term denoting physical, spiritual, or mental weakness that can be described, uh, that can even used to be used to describe someone on their deathbed. I mean, so this person's sick, it's not just like having the flu or having a cough 
or getting over like a minor surgery. This is something much different. This is pretty much where someone's bedridden because they have to call upon, meaning the elders have to come to them. They don't go to them. So we see this person's sick, and then James tells the elders, right, the elders, to come and pray over him. Now, I know the word elder isn't really a Baptist thing. I mean, it, it, it should be, and it's coming back. But from my experience in general, when Baptists hear the word elder, they think of some domine- domineering type leader that from somewhere at someone else's church at some place, right? It's like secondhand information. But in the Bible, the elders are the spiritual leaders of the church. I mean, there's absolutely no way of getting around it. It's an absolute fact. There's elders, and then you have deacons, two very different offices in the church. And elders are both pastors, the words used interchangeably, and the other spiritual leaders in the church. And notice it's plural, isn't it? You see, the idea of singular leadership in a local church isn't a biblical thing. There's always a plurality of leadership. And we know where the word elders come from because in the Jewish community, this is something they had all throughout. The elders, the ones who are senior, the ones who have wisdom, the spiritual leaders. In fact, in the New Testament, the word elder is used 29 times referring to the religious leaders of Israel. Meaning these are the wise people, the older people, the one who have experience, who would lead their communities well. And this word is used 20 times in reference to local church leadership. So elders is a thing, and James tells us to call upon the elders to have them come pray over this sick person. And the promise attached is the difficult part. I'm just telling you, I don't understand. Because it says, and the prayer offered in faith will what? Will. I wish it said might. Like, I could do a lot with might. But will? James, what do you mean, will? You mean it might? No, he says will. So this is one of those things that's hard. So let's just walk through a little bit because theologically we can get a little messed up because what we do know that happens, this, this is used in a very bad way where we have some televangelists for twenty nine ninety five will make you better, right? And if you don't get better, they point to this saying you don't have faith. It's your fault. You don't love God enough. And then we just sit here already sick, now questioning our faith, wondering what's wrong. So theologically, we've got to be careful with this, and let's work through what we know James can't be saying. For one, we know James can't be saying that all people will be healed. Because we know from experience and biblically that death is a real thing. The Bible is very clear about this. Look what it says, Romans 6, 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death. So we will all die. It's death rate still 100%, isn't it? Yep, still 100%. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. That is an amazing thing. Eternal life is found through Christ, but we will die. And secondly, we see Hebrews 9, 27 says, just as, appeared, just, just as people are destined to die once, so it's going to happen, and after that face the judgment. So we know James can't be saying that we won't die. Because we know death is part of living. In fact, that's what makes living so great, isn't it? Knowing that it's short. Knowing that it won't be forever. James already reminded us it is but a vapor that can appear and go away. So we all have to come to grips with the fact that we will die. But we're promised eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, going back to the verse, a lot of people... A lot of people want to make this, we'll make the sick person well because we know we're going to die. A lot of people want to take this and say, well, it must mean something more spiritual. Right? It must be talking about like spiritually made whole. And I wish I could tell you that's the truth, but that's not what James is saying. He's talking about sickness, people who are sick, and them being made well. So it's not just a spiritual thing. He's not saying that. He's not saying that all people will be made well because we know people still die. So what can it be? Well, let's remember one more thing. Remember Paul? Remember Paul when Paul had this thing going on and he wanted God to deliver him from it? What did God say? Yeah, here's the verse. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited. Isn't that interesting? Paul said, I'd be conceited and prideful if it wasn't for this sickness. Therefore, in, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So whatever is going on, whatever his thorn in the flesh is, it's radically clear that he was tormented by it. He was suffering by it. It was an ailment in his life, something he didn't want to deal with. How many of you are dealing with things you don't want to deal with? Yep, okay, so you get this. I was like, yeah, I don't want to deal with this, but yet God's given it to me any time. And he says, three times I asked the Lord, where's it at? All right, it's there. He says, three times I asked the Lord to take it away. Now, if Paul's counting that he did this three times, I imagine this was more than just three prayers before work, right? If he can count the number of times, Lord, heal me from this. No, no, no. This must have been something specific, something big he did to try to get the Lord to hear him, to try to get the Lord to answer him. But the Lord's answer was, no. I'm not taking it from you. Because my power is made perfect. You will do greater things in your weakness than you would if you didn't have that and you were in your own power. So God will break us and God will give us things in our life to humble of us, to keep us reliant upon him. So we know that whatever Paul's dealing with, he wanted God to take it. God said no. Paul had plenty of faith, but it wasn't in God's plan to heal him. And perhaps, perhaps that's why James says, first, go to the Lord in prayer. You seek him, you talk to him, you find out what's going on between you and him. Because you may want that thing to go away, and God might quite frankly say, no. I gave it to you, you need to deal with it. So we know James can't be saying that God will heal everything. Because death is still part of life. We know James can't be saying that God will take away things that he's purposely placed in our life that's according to his purposes. So how do we then pray for healing? What will be healed? Well, frankly, I don't, I don't know. But Scott McKnight gives us some advice for elders who are trying to practice this. He says, first up, ask for wisdom and faith before we go praying like this. They should determine if it's God's intention to heal because it's not always God's intention to heal. And I can tell you, I've been at the bedside of people, I've, I've talked to people who are going through this, who it's near the end of life, and I just knew in my hearts of hearts, it was time. Me praying for healing would not be appropriate. I would have been almost sinning, I feel, because I knew that wasn't in God's plan. I don't always know that, but sometimes I just know that it's not appropriate to pray for healing. You'd be doing an injustice to the person when God is taking this person home. And so here, wisdom is radically important. And do you remember at the very, very beginning of the book, James says, if any of you lack wisdom, do what? Ask God, right? This is one of those times we ask God for wisdom. Because in a few verses, we're going to see him talk about the prophet Elijah. And when he gives us an example of a prophet, we have to remember, prophets always did things in accordance with what God was going to do. When they would pronounce something was going to happen, it's not that they did it, it's that God was going to do it, and they spoke about it in advance. They foretold, they said, hey, God's going to do this, watch it happen. So we need to ask for wisdom and faith. Ask if God wants to heal this person. Next, we have to make sure we're asking for things the right way. James told us, remember in chapter 4, he says you don't have because you don't ask, and when you do ask, you're asking with the wrong motives. Do you remember that? So we can ask God the wrong way. You say, Brian, what's the wrong way for healing? Well, if it's attached to twenty nine ninety five in a magical prayer rug, Y'all seen that stuff? Yeah, that's asking for healing in the wrong way. That's the wrong thing. That's not appropriate. We're not asking for us to be famous or us to be rich or our power. We're asking the right things for the right purposes the right way. And then lastly, he says, ask for healing with faith, which is why we have to be faith-filled. If we're asking for healing from God, we have to know that we're not the ones healing them. And we're utterly dependent upon God for this. And so it takes faith from the person who is sick to call upon the elders to do this. It takes faith from the elders to go to the person and go, let's, let's go do this. Let's go anoint with oil. Let's go pray over this person. If this is what God's leading us, let's be bold in our faith. Because let's just be honest. It's the 21st century. This seems kind of weird, right? But I can tell you I've been healed by this before. We don't have time to talk about it today, and if you were to come on Wednesday nights, you'd learn all about it. 
to be a person who comes out on Wednesday nights. That's an, that's an application today. But, but it works. Prayer works. So you have to have the faith. So he's calling us to be people of faith. And I don't know how it all works, but I think this is a great start. He calls you and me, us, to be people of faith. Next, which may give us an indication to what he's talking about, uh, he says this. Remember, he ends like this. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. He calls us to be people who confess. Look at what he finishes. I meant verse 16. He goes into be a person who confesses. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. How many of us are like, nope? Let's be honest. How many of y'all do this right now? Yes, yeah, is a challenging thing, right? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be. Oh, so it's one thing to talk about the elders doing it, right? We're like, that's for the pastors. They need to figure this out. But this one's for whom? Everybody else. I know. This is challenging, right? Like, well, we're talking about some spiritual power. I know. And we're in a Baptist church. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah, but this is what James is teaching us, to be a person who confesses. And I know it's uncomfortable. But confessing our sins, he says, because sometimes there are things going on in your life that you need to confess, that you need to repent of, you need to get out of there so you can be healed both spiritually, mentally, and, and perhaps also physically. You see, this isn't just for the elders. This is for all of us. You, me, we confess to each other and pray. And I know it's something we don't talk about often, but did you know, according to the Bible, sin can lead to sickness? Sin leads to sickness. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, this is the Lord's Supper, and, dr- excuse me, those without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves, That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. He says, you want to know why you're not feeling well? You know why you're not, what's going on? Because you're in sin. You need to deal with it. You need to confess it. And you will be made whole. That's what James teaches us. And we already know this. The world's just figuring it out. A lot of mental health issues, not all, please don't hear all, but a lot of mental health issues come from sin. A lot of times depression, shame, and guilt is coming from something that happened in the past. I've experienced it. Perhaps you have as well. There's power in confessing to each other. You see, sometimes we just need to do it. I remember when I was a young man, the Lord was tugging on my heart really good, and I needed to confess my sin. I didn't understand it, but I drove to the church that was about 30 minutes away, and I sat on the front porch, and I just waited. Lo and behold, the pastor came. I didn't know I was there. I just needed to talk to him. This was before cell phones. Everybody had cell phones, stuff like that, right? And I just waited, and he came through, and I just unloaded on him. I just confessed, here's what's going on. Here's what's, what's happening. I just unloaded, not like in a priestly way to be absolved my sins, but I needed to tell somebody what was going on in here. And so I unloaded on him, and I did. That day, I just let it all out, and he listened, and he prayed. And from that day forward, I turned over a radically new, radical new leaf. Things just changed. I had to get it out. I couldn't keep it secret. I needed to bring it forward and have somebody to help me hold, be accountable. So why does confession work? I'm not too sure. But it works. One pastor gave some pretty good advice, I thought. He said, there's a thing as public confession. And public confession is when we need to stand before a bunch of people. If we publicly sinned or we've done a whole group wrong, we just need to let it out to the whole group. If what we've done is known by the church or by the community, sometimes we just need to make a public confession of sin. But other times we need to privately confess. If we've sinned against someone or something else and we just need to get it off our chest, sometimes we go to a friend, sometimes we go to that person. You guys understand sin is so different when it comes to the private matters. It depends on who we need to go to. And sometimes you just need to go to a pastor, not to be absolved, but just someone to hear you out and to pray. And we do this kind of stuff all the time. I think there's some wisdom in that. Sometimes we publicly confess if we need to, and sometimes we just privately confess. But what we realize is that James is saying, well, what James said is a lot of times that confession is what will lead to what? Healing. Just letting it out. Talking to somebody. Being prayed with. 
by somebody. And God will heal us through that. So James, at least when he's talking about healing, it at least speaks about dealing with sin. And perhaps what that person is who is um, really sick, James is saying it may be sin, so you need to work through this stuff as well. So what we've learned, I'm telling you, it's rapid fire, right? He's talking about a lot of different things all at once. James says we must be people of integrity. We must be people who pray. We must be people who praise. We must be people who have strong faith. We must be people who confess our sins. But also, he says, be a person of spiritual power. They all go together. Isn't this cool? James 5, 17 through 18, he says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. You're like, what? I mean, Elijah, he did. He like called fire down from heaven. I know he was just like us. He said, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So it's easy to assume here, because he brings up Elijah, the great prophet. Well, he must just be talking to pastors, right? He must be talking to elders in their prayer life. But no, who did he just tell to pray for each other? Us. He's telling you and me that we can have this power like Elijah, that there's this spiritual power that you and I can tap into. And that Elijah was just a human being. And we can pray for each other. We can confess to each other. And we can expect healing if we go to our brothers and sisters in Christ and talk about this stuff and let it out. And then we pray for each other during that. I mean, do you have people you can just unload to what's going on and you can expect not judgment but prayer? That's the church. That's what he's calling us to be. This is the type of people we are to be, people of spiritual power. And lastly, he brings this up. We're almost done. Elijah, um, James 5, 19 through 20. Be a person who loves. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Listen, love cares enough about people to have an uncomfortable conversation. Love doesn't say, well, I don't want to judge them. It's not a big deal. It's okay. Just let them go. We don't want to deal with it. No, no. Love calls us to reach out to people who've walked away from the truth, who've walked away from the faith, who's walked away from God's church, who's walked away from the community of God's people. Love calls us to do what? Call them out on it. Call them up and say, where are you at? Where have you been? We missed you. And you say, well, Brian, that's just too invasive. But do you love them? Would you call out your children? Every parent's like, well, absolutely. Why? Because you love about them? You care about them? The same is true for our, true for our church. We should have the ability to call our brothers and sisters in Christ and say, listen, what you're doing is not okay. Look, and you're walking away, or you've walked away. Remember, remember when we did the series of, of Hebrews? I told you how convicted I was about that, because the writer of Hebrews continually tells us, watch for people who are walking away. Watch for people who are wandering away. It's not okay. Don't let them fall away. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be restoring people. We should be helping people. We should be watching people who are falling away and saying, no, 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 come on. You're not going to fall through the cracks. Get back, cracks. You're going to be, get back in Sunday school. Get back in worship service. Come on. You're needed. You see, James says, be a person of integrity, of prayer, of praise, of faith, of spiritual power, a person who confesses and loves each other. Listen, church, James is calling us at the very end of the letter. He says, this is what it looks like to be the people of God. This is what it looks like to be a church. Not just come on Sunday mornings to check the box off. My goodness, take that off your checklist. It shouldn't be on your checklist. You are a child of God if you've been born. If you've been born again by Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. And your entire life should be dedicated to worshiping and glorifying Him. Sunday morning is the time that you come to be encouraged, to be challenged, to meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ, to have this type of community, to confess, to be prayed for. This is what James is calling us as a church to become to be filled with the Spirit, 
to be filled with integrity because we're not going to confess to each other unless we trust the person, right? Yeah, do you see how all these work together? All of them come together and say, this is what the community of God's people looks like. Watch out for each other. Pray for each other. Confess to each other. Sing together. Church, this is what it looks like to be the church. And can you imagine if we were committed to this type of living? To be full of integrity, to be full of prayer, to be full of the Spirit, to be over there praying with people, over people, asking the Lord to heal them, confessing our sins, asking to be healed. Can you imagine if we tapped into that spiritual side of church? Because do you realize that the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is living inside of us? To quote Paul, Paul says that. We have that power available, and that's what James is calling us to, to be these type of people. And I guarantee you, if we did this, we would be an unstoppable, unshakable movement of God like this community has never seen. You say, Brian, Brian, wait, that's that's a little much, that's a little dramatic. Read the book of Acts. They shook the world. They shook Jerusalem. Being these type of people, we would shake Conway. And say, hey, it's all about Jesus. Come meet him. Come learn about him. Because we want to help you go in a relationship with him too. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. Father, we thank you for preserving this letter from James to challenge us how to live our faith. Lord, it has been a challenging letter. It's challenged each and every one of our faith. But Father, I pray that you help us be these types of people. We know we cannot do this alone. We know it only comes through the power of your spirit. We know that all goodness only comes from you. So, Father, help us live this way every single day. Allow us to come together as a community of your people and live for you. Help us learn to live this way as a church so we can bring you glory in all that we do. Father, we love you. We thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray.